In this final part of the integumentary system, we're going to focus on the anatomy and the physiology of the accessory structures. So just as a review, the accessory structures include the hair, the hair follicle which makes the hair, the oil gland, now we're going to introduce a new term, previously I've just called it the oil gland, but the oil gland is known as the sebaceous gland. Then we'll take a look at two types of sweat glands and then we'll finish it up with taking a look at the fingernails and the toenails. All of these structures are actually derived from the epidermis and then they project down and are living and located in the dermis. Right, so we had said this previously that the accessory structures live in the dermis but then they project up through the epidermis to be, to be, to be seen on the outside of the body. So let's begin our discussion of the accessory structures by taking a look at the anatomy of the uh, the anatomy of the hair. Hair covers almost all of the body except the palms, the sides of our fingers, the soles, the sides of our toes, the lips, and some parts of the external genitalia. Otherwise, most of our body has some hair on it. Why do we have hair? Uh, the function of hair is to protect and to insulate. Right? You may know this, um, maybe if you have a baby or you see a little baby that doesn't have a lot of hair on their head when they're, they're born, uh, we don't want to take them out into the cold weather because they would lose a lot of the heat through their scalp. So um, the hair actually helps to insulate and keep us warm and it protects us. It helps to guard openings, right? As much as people don't want to look at ear hair and nose hair in their nostrils, that hair is important because it helps to protect, protect from particles or insects from getting in. And we're going to see in a minute that the base of each hair follicle has a sensory receptor which helps to determine uh, motion if the hair is moving. So let's take a look at the hair follicle first, where it is and some of its associated structures. We would find the follicle deep down in the dermis and its function is to produce non-living hair. So if we take a look over here, this is a picture from uh, the Martini book, just to kind of give us a, a reference again. This is the epidermis, right? This is the papillary region of the dermis, and then this is going to be the reticular region of the dermis right over here. So we can see the hair follicle is this whole structure down over here. All of this is located deep down inside the dermis. This blue tissue on here is actually the connective tissue sheath and its job is to actually anchor the follicle into the dermis. This way we don't rip the follicle out of the dermis. Right? We want to keep it inside the dermis. So this connective sheath does that for us. Right? And that's what we have over here. The follicle is wrapped in a dense connective tissue sheath. So the two structures I want you to know that are associated with the follicle, if you want to highlight this one first, is called the hair root plexus. Let's look at that first and I'll describe it. This black line right over here going up and you see it branching, these are actually nerve fibers. They're called the hair root plexus. Any movement of the hair up over here will cause the follicle to move a little bit down here and stimulate this nerve and tell the brain that the nerve, uh, excuse me, that the follicle is moving. Let's just go back a second. The second structure that I want you to highlight is the erector pili muscle. Now this is an involuntary muscle, it's a smooth muscle, that when it contracts it causes the hair on our body to stand up and it gives that characteristic appearance of goosebumps. So I'm going to take you to this picture first. Again, this is the Martini book. We'll go back to the Tortora book also in a moment. So here's the hair follicle down in here, which is looking into it, it's cut. Here it's not, here it's not cut. But you see this muscle right here it goes from the, the base of the follicle, roughly, and it goes up to the epidermis. So when this muscle contracts, it's going to pull the follicle this way, 
and that's going to cause the hair over here to go this way and to stand up. And when we were hairier or furrier, that was a way of uh, keeping us warm. When your hair stood up, it actually uh, helped to keep us warm. I'll talk more about that when we do the nervous system. But when this muscle contracts, it also pulls the epidermis down this way. And that's what brings the epidermis down and gives the goosebump appearance. So you're going to call this muscle the erector pili. Okay, again, here's the nerve root plexus right here. Here's the erector pili. Let's look at the um, Tortora book. Again, here's the hair follicle. So here's your erector pili muscle right there. That's smooth muscle. And again, the nerve fibers here in Tortora are yellow. Again, the hair root plexus is going to be those nerves right there. So those are the two associated structures that I want you to know. All right, the hair root plexus. Uh, uh, root hair plexus, hair root plexus, same type of thing. And the erector pili muscle. So let's take a look now at the regions of a hair, right? The lower part of the hair is known as the root. The upper part of the hair we're going to call the shaft. So the hair that's in the follicle inside here, all of this would be the root. The hair that's exposed out over here on the surface of the skin, this is going to be called the shaft. Arbitrarily, I use the sebaceous gland as the dividing line. Most textbooks kind of show it there. So we kind of drew like an imaginary line right here. The hair inside here would be the root. The hair above would be the shaft. Now, if we took a piece of hair, let's say you pulled a piece of hair out of your scalp and we chopped it in half and we looked at it underneath the microscope, we would see that the hair has three different parts to it. There's going to be an inner part called the medulla. Then there's some cells around the medulla called the cortex. Then the part of the hair that you would actually be touching is called the cuticle. That's the most superficial. So this is a picture that I really like. This is a picture of a piece of hair in the follicle. So it's kind of down near the near the root. Let's take a look at the three parts of the hair first. We're going to do the medulla, the cortex, and the cuticle. So these cells right here in the middle, this is going to be called the medulla. Now the medulla contains some keratin, but it's a softer type of keratin that gives a little bit of flexibility so the hair is bendable. These cells here around the medulla are going to be called the cortex. This also contains keratin, but notice it's a harder keratin. It, it gives the hair some strength, some stiffness. And finally, the third layer I'd like you to know is the part that you would be touching. And this piece of hair was outside the body, these little kind of crescent white cells here. This is going to be the cuticle. These also contain keratin, which are uh, a stiffer, harder type of keratin. All right, so the three parts of the hair that I want you to know, and I want you to know them from uh, inside out or outside in, but just know the three layers, the medulla, cortex, cuticle. Now, what we're looking at here, the remaining part, is the follicle. Because again, this is a section of the hair in a follicle. So the three parts of the follicle that we want to know, here's the follicle structure, include the internal root sheath. Then these purplish cells out here is the external root sheath. And this thin line, this purple smooth line right here, is known as the glassy membrane. All right, so those are the three parts that I'd like you to know. Internal root sheath, external root sheath, glassy membrane. They make up the follicle. Then these blue cells out here are actually the connective tissue sheath I was mentioning earlier that hold the follicle in the dermis. All right, so this is a great picture that shows uh, the parts of the hair and the follicle. All right, so again, just going back to the notes, medulla, cortex, and cuticle are the three parts of the hair. 
the follicle internal root sheath, external root sheath, and the glassy membrane. Right? And again, all of that is going to be wrapped in a connective tissue sheath. Here's another picture showing the same thing, just from a different perspective. This is more of a frontal view. So let's do the three parts of the hair first. These cells in the middle here, medulla, surrounding the medulla, oh, cortex. The brown line right here, brownish tissue, that is the cuticle. All right, so that's all going to be the hair. Then these cells here, internal root sheath, the purple cells, external root sheath, this line right here, glassy membrane, and then this is the connective tissue sheath right here that's holding the follicle in the dermis. All right, so it's just another perspective of the um, parts of the hair and parts of the follicle. Again, this is the same thing. This is just a picture from Tortora, again, showing the medulla, the cortex, and the cuticle right over here. I get my cursor in there, right? Medulla cortex cuticle. And then it shows the internal root sheath, the external root sheath. On this diagram, they don't show the uh, glassy membrane, but it would be there. So let's take a look at hair production. How does hair formed? At the bottom of the follicle, the follicle is a little bit expanded, forming a bulb. That bulb, if we look over here, like this part of the follicle is kind of expanded out, kind of rounded out. That would be the hair, uh, the hair bulb. That bulb is actually surrounding this upward projection right here. This is called the papilla. And if you look at it, doesn't it look like a mound? Remember we said the word from mound like is papilla. So again, it's just kind of reinforcing what we learned from our previous lessons. This is a mound-like structure. What's important here is that blood vessels enter this mound-like structure, bringing nutrients to these cells right here. These are like stem cells that are continually dividing, and they are what make our new hair. We call these stem cells the matrix. Okay, so papilla is this big mound area. What's important here is that blood vessels go inside the papilla and they nourish the matrix so that these cells can continue to divide and produce the hair. Okay, so the hair bulb, then you want to highlight the papilla, right? Uh, the hair matrix are the, if you want to just even put here, these are stem cells that produce the hair, right? They're continually dividing and they produce the hair for us. Now, our hairs, let's say the hair on our scalp, will grow for about two to three years, maybe even longer. I've heard that they even go up to five years, and they'll grow for that period of time, and then they will stop growing for a period of time and then get turned on again. So our hairs actually turn off and turn on as far as hair growth. So a uh, hair growth cycle describes how hairs are grown and shed. As hair grows, the root is firmly attached to the matrix of the follicle. Again, remember the matrix is the cells, the stem cells that are continually making hair. So as the matrix produces new cells, it pushes the hair up and makes our hair grow longer. That's why we have to get our hair cut. But at some point, the follicle is going to become inactive and it stops growing. We now call that hair that's in the follicle club hair and that remains there it won't be it won't be growing once the follicle gets turned on again gets activated again the follicle starts producing new hair and it pushes the club hair out right they say on average an adult loses about a hundred club hairs per day right so if you ever brush your hair and you see some brush uh, having you know some hair in it, so the, the, some hair being in the brush, right? That's probably some club hair that's being shed. That's normal. Now, the hair on our body, most of the hair that's kind of a soft, finer hair, we call vellus hair. But other hair on our body is a little bit more heavy and pigmented. For instance, the hair on our scalp, the eyebrows, 
your eyelashes and here we have parts of the body after puberty puberty if you just want to put here pubic hair axillary hair right which is the armpit those are more heavy th thicker pigmented hair that we call terminal hair all right so again most of the hair like on your face or um, not, maybe your 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 like your cheek area uh, your arms your your neck your back that type of thing is usually a finer vellus hair as far as hair color, same as hair skin, uh, this, the skin color, um, melanocytes are going to produce pigment that goes in our matrix to give the hair some type of color, and that's genetically determined, right? So some people have blonde hair, some people have dark hair, based on their genetics. Okay, so that concludes our hair. Let's take a look at the glands of the skin. The first type of gland I just want to describe is known as a sebaceous gland. This is what I had earlier called an oil gland. Something that you will discuss or if you haven't yet in tissues. It produces oil by a type of secretion known as holocrine secretion. What this means is the cells inside the gland that are the most superficial actually burst and they become part of the product. Right? They actually become the oil. Um, so now the oil is actually going to be discharged into the hair follicle and we call the oil sebum right? and its job is to go up the hair shaft and it lubricates and protects the hair shaft and it also inhibits the growth of bacteria. Let me go back this way for a moment just to show you right here. Go to... Here's the hair shaft here. So what we're seeing here, guys, this is the sebaceous gland. So this will produce the oil. The oil goes out of the sebaceous gland here. It goes on the hair shaft, so it lubricates the hair shaft and then it goes out onto the surface of the skin and the oil actually helps to protect and lubricate our skin. All right, so that's the relationship of the oil gland to the hair shaft. Okay, sweat glands, we're going to review, there are two types of sweat glands. One is called the apocrine sweat gland, the other one is called the eccrine sweat gland. So let's do the sebaceous glands first. So this is a simple branch alveolar gland. What that means is it has a round shape to it. Whenever we see an alveolar gland, it means that it has a round shape and it's associated with the hair follicle just like I described before. But I do want you to know that we do have some sebaceous follicles. These are oil glands, sebaceous glands, that are not right here, highlight that, not associated with a hair follicle. They actually have a little tube that puts the oil right out onto the surface of the skin. We tend to find these more in the face, on the back, the chest, around the nipples, and the external genitalia. So here's a picture. This is called the sebaceous follicle. If you notice, it's not attached to a hair. This is the sebaceous gland here. Remember I said before that the sebaceous gland produces the oil goes out of the gland and then up the hair this way. That's sebaceous gland. A sebaceous follicle, notice, not touching a hair. So all these uh, glands here make the oil and then the oil goes up this tube and then out onto the surface of the skin. And like I said, these are the regions that they tend to be uh, located. Okay, those are called sebaceous follicles. Now, this is actually just a cross section of um, the sebaceous gland. Uh, here's the gland here. This is a part of the gland. These are the glandular cells. They produce the oil. The oil goes into the tube and then this is where the hair would be and then go up along the uh, up along the hair. Right? They actually took the hair out in this uh, in this image. And here's a real micrograph of the um, the oil gland. So sweat glands. There are two types of sweat glands. Right, these are going to be the, ap the first one we're going to do is the apocrine sweat gland. Right, these are the ones that are found in the armpits. So when you sweat, 
from the, in your armpit sweat. This is called the apocrine sweat gland. They're also around the nipples and they also are in the pubic region. Um, they produce their secretion also into a hair follicle. So just like the oil gland, the apocrine gland is going to produce their secretion right into a hair follicle via a type of secretion. Uh, secretion called apocrine secretion. Again, this is covered in the tissues chapter, but I'll kind of review it quickly. Uh, in an apocrine uh, gland, the, the cells at the surface of the gland, the top part of the gland pinches off and becomes part of the product. So this is not a watery secretion. It's actually more of a cloudy, thicker type of secretion. Um, the bacteria that are on our body will, will start to break down this secretion and it produces odors and that's why sometimes when people sweat from the armpit there's actually an odor to it. So I actually always say uh, if we were in a real lecture I would tell the class apocrine sweat glands produce smelly sweat. It's sweat that we can actually uh, smell. All right, so any sweat from the pubic region uh, the uh, axilla will be producing apocrine sweat and uh, again that's typically smelly sweat. One thing about these glands is they actually have some smooth muscle around them called myoepithelial cells. You can highlight this. These are actually cells that squeeze the gland and push the secretion into the uh, into the hair follicle. So let's just say this is a a pu uh, not, let's say this is an axillary hair. We'll talk. This is a, an armpit hair right here. So if you notice, the duct of the sweat gland goes right into where the hair shaft is over here, and then here's the gland. So the 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 sweat would be produced in here. The myoepithelial cells, which aren't shown here, will squeeze this part of the gland here and push the sweat up into. The, the hair shaft onto the hair shaft and then the sweat goes up onto the hair shaft. Again, axillary and pubic regions are like this. And again, here would be one in the um, from the Tortora book. Here's a apocrine sweat gland. How do I know it's an apocrine gland? If I follow the duct up, it goes right into the hair shaft over here. The second type of sweat gland is known as the eccrine sweat gland. Right? This is what they used to call merocrine sweat gland, so you may hear that term. These are coiled tubular glands, but these are not associated with a hair follicle. They're going to have a duct or a tube that discharge directly onto the skin surface. When we sweat, from these types of glands, we can actually sense that water on our body. We call that sensible perspiration. In a previous lesson, I had talked about insensible perspiration and just mentioned sensible perspiration. But now I want you to know that sensible, sensible perspiration is when we sweat from our sweat glands, these eccrine glands. This is the um, gland that's most prevalent all over our body. So they're widely distributed, but they're especially found on our palms and our soles. So if you, your palms start to sweat, say you get a little bit nervous or you're shaking somebody's hand and your, your hand gets warm, you'll find that your palm sweats. That's because there's a lot of these glands on our uh, on our palms and soles. But they're all over the body. If you started to sweat on your, for, uh, your forehead or your chest, right, this would all be these um, eccrine types of glands. Uh, majority of the secretion here, now this is a more watery secretion. I had said earlier that the apocrine sweat gland was a thicker, cloudy. This one's going to be mostly water. So why do these glands work and what do they do for us? The main job is to cool us down, right? The reason we sweat is to reduce our body temperature. That's one of the main functions. Uh, we sometimes use the word thermoregulation, right? Thermo meaning temperature regulation obviously is to regulate. Uh, another reason we sweat is to excrete water and some electrolytes and believe it or not it, it's a protection. You know, sweating actually you know, cleanses the skin. It washes away chemicals or any microbes that type of thing. So here would be uh, an example of an um, 
Ekron sweat gland. Again, here they have we have a coiled tube, but they cut into it, so we're looking into the tubes. But you can see some of the coiled tube here it would be like this. But notice this gland is not associated with the hair follicle. The tube, which is called the sweat duct, goes straight up to the surface of the skin, and then there's an opening where the sweat comes out. And you may have heard this term. We call that a sweat pore. Okay, so this is the type of gland that's most uh, most of our uh, most of our body. So here's a picture from Tortora book. This would be an anecrin sweat gland. So notice coiled tube down here, and if you follow the duct, notice it's not touching a hair. It goes straight up to a sweat pore right over here. So this is an example of the eccrine. The apocrine again is always going to go into a hair. We just want to mention uh, there are some other glands in the body. Um, mammary glands are obviously in the breast and they produce milk. These are covered when we do the reproductive system. And then one other gland I just want to mention are found in the ear. They produce earwax. These are called ceruminous glands. The, this type of um, secretion is a, a, a more sticky, harder type of a, a secretion, and we call earwax cerumen. Uh, its function is actually to line the uh, the ear to catch any debris uh, and. and let that debris stick to the earwax so that it doesn't reach the eardrum. Okay, so what controls our glands? There's a part of the nervous system, and we're going to get into this later in the semester, called the autonomic nervous system. This is a part of the nervous system that just kind of works. You don't have to really think about it. It's unconscious. It just does its thing without you merely being aware of it. The uh, ANS controls the oil gland, the sebaceous glands, right? So when you start producing oil, that's from your nervous system. And it also pr uh, stimulates the apocrine sweat glands. The eccrine sweat glands, these now are not controlled by the nervous system. They're controlled independently, right? They'll turn on all by themselves, especially if an area of the body gets heat. And think about this. Maybe you've been holding hands with somebody with your right hand, right? Boyfriend or a girlfriend, husband or wife, and you're holding their hands uh, for a period of time. You may notice that you're, if you're holding with the right hand, your right hand is sweating, but your left hand isn't, right? The reason is the eccrine glands in your right palm turned on. Um, if you went to the gym after this presentation today to work out and you're on the treadmill and your whole body gets hot, right? all of your eccrine glands turn on to help cool you down. So they're turned on all by themselves. They don't need the uh, nervous system to turn them on. And I had mentioned this before, the concept that we, the term that we use, guys, for controlling temperature is thermoregulation, right? This is the main function of sensible perspiration where we sense, um, we can sense the, the, the water on our, on our skin. Right? And then finally, the eccrine sweat glands work with the cardiovascular system to regulate body temperature. Again, when you get hot, your blood vessels in your skin are going to dilate. Now there's going to be more blood in your skin, and we lose that heat from your blood from your body into the environment, which cools you down. And that's the reason your skin turns red uh, or pink when you work out. The final accessory organ is the 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 nails. Uh, the the function of our nails is to actually protect our fingers and our toes. Now these just like hair are made up of dead cells. I'm sorry, just like the hair and skin actually are made up of dead cells that are packed with keratin. Um, you'll see as you learn to examine patients that you always, always want to look at uh, an individual's uh, nails because different disease processes can show up in the nail. Uh, for example, here in psoriasis, which is a skin condition, uh, the individual, the patient may have pitted nails. You actually see little dimples inside the nails. So, <coughs> excuse me, let's take a look at <coughs> the structure of a nail. If you were to look at your fingernails right now, it would look something like this from the top. This main part right here is called the body. 
right? So the main part of the, the, the nail is the body. Um, it's the visible portion of the nail. If you were to look at the nail, the nail is actually curved. So the, the body is curved like this. You see it kind of curves down. So the curved end of the nail actually goes into this little groove right over here called the lateral nail groove. There's going to be one on this side too. So the, the nail goes into that little lateral nail groove and then a piece of skin will actually cover that. This part right here and right over here is called the lateral nail fold. <clears throat> All right, so again, the body's not straight or flat. It actually is curved down. The edge of the nail goes into the lateral nail groove, and then a piece of like skin actually goes over and covers it. All right, you could actually, if you try this on yourself, you could pull this back a little bit this way, and you could look in and see your lateral nail groove. All right, so we got that. Um, the hyp the hyponychium. If we go to a picture here, this is the the nail body, and now this is the free edge of the nail. This is what we clip when we uh, cut our fingernails and toenails. There's a little piece of tissue here that holds the nail free edge to the fingertip. This is called the hyponychium right there that's the hyponychium so that's its job is to hold the free edge of the nail down okay so we got the nail body the nail folds the nail grooves right we got that we got the hyponychium the root so the root is where we have let's go to this picture here stem cells that are continually producing our nail. So these are also just like in the skin, the basal layer of the uh, skin um, and the matrix in the hair. These are the cells that are continually dividing. So as they divide, they push the nail out like this. And this is the reason our, our nail needs to be clipped. So the nail root is right above our finger bone right here. This is the distal finger bone, right? It's called, it's called the phalange, right? They labeled it as the phalanx, but that's where the nail root is. The epinychium, for those of you that have had a manicure, is what they call the cuticle. This is actually some stratum corneum of the epidermis growing over the nail. So they call that the epinychium. Let's see, we probably see it best right over here. So here's the nail body. So there's a little bit of a film right here that's part of the stratum corneum of the epidermis growing out over the nail. They call that the epinychium. Then this little white area right here, this little crescent, this is called the lunula. That's our last structure over here. Um, there's a little bit uh, uh, an uh, a blocking of the uh, blood vessels, so we don't see the blood vessels that well right there, producing this white moon-shaped area, so it's kind of a crescent shape. We call that the lunula. And this is our last slide of the integument. This is from Tortora, just kind of showing the same types of things. We could see the nail root. We could see the epinychium a little bit better on this picture here. Again, that's that stratum corneum that grows uh, from the epidermis. Here's the lunula, the white part. Here's the nail body. Here's the free edge. Here's the hyponychium.